Welcome to an episode of the Quality During Design podcast. I'm Diana Dini. Let's talk about supply chain management, specifically how it relates to product development processes and engineers and the decisions that we need to make when we're designing stuff. In this episode, I interview Kevin Bailey about this topic, how product design engineers and product development leadership can be affected by and also affect the supply chain for their products and how that can affect the long-term product design success. This interview is part of our series, A Chat with Cross-Functional Experts. Our focus is speaking with people that are typically part of a cross-functional team within engineering projects. We discuss their viewpoints and perspectives regarding new products, the values they bring to new product development, and how they're involved and work with product design engineering teammates. Kevin Bailey is the founder and CEO of Design First, a leading product development consultancy. He is an engineer, and he's known for his expertise in integrating cost considerations early in the design process and helping clients navigate supply chain solutions. In this episode, Kevin and I talk about how to approach supply chain management from a risk point of view, including balancing risk and opportunity. Kevin shares his framework for successful supply chain management, which is a four-letter acronym, FACT. We also talk about responsibilities towards supply chain management, how engineers are related, and how leadership is responsible. Kevin also answers my questions about the current state of supply chain management. I look forward to introducing you to Kevin and our conversation after this brief introduction. Hello, and welcome to Quality During Design, the place to use quality thinking to create products others love for less. Each week, we talk about ways to use quality during design and product development. I'm your host, Diana Dini. I'm a senior level quality professional and engineer with over 20 years of experience in manufacturing and design. Listen in and then join us. Visit qualityduringdesign.com. Welcome to another episode of Quality During Design. Today we have a guest interview. I'm talking with Kevin Bailey. He's the founder and CEO of Design First, a business that offers product design, development, and transfer to manufacturing. He's passionate about product design and he's a business executive. He helps guide CEOs, startups, and established companies through the maze of hardware product development. Kevin is here today to talk about supply chain management, in ways that affect engineering decisions, and share some actionable steps to best work with supply chain managers. Kevin, welcome to the Quality During Design podcast. Hi, Dan. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, you have a very broad and deep experience in the engineering world. So what are uh, some of your biggest likes about product design, and how do you relate to supply chain management? Uh, that's a great question. I've been doing this since the early 80s. Uh, so I've been at this quite a few years. The things I've learned over time working with large companies and with small companies is the nature of how supply decisions lead to reliability issues. As you as designers and engineers uh, make decisions early stage on what a product will be, what it includes, what componentry will be part of it, and the overall performance and function and specification of features within a product. Now, do you get involved directly with supply chain management itself, or are you uh, are you working with other people that uh, you're coordinating with other people from an engineering standpoint on supply chain management? The answer is both. Uh, The types of clients, we're a team of 30. So we're a cross-functional group that includes engineers, designers, um, business strategists, marketing strategists, as well as production support and transfer to manufacturing people. So there's different types of clients that come to Design First, which are either larger companies that maybe they have a portfolio of products. They want some help by a specialist team in one of the areas they may feel weak in, but they've got their own in-house product development. 
we deal with other startups, companies that are new to hardware product development or, or physical product development uh, devices. Uh, and we also deal with entrepreneurs that are new to the business world and supply, as well as new to product development. So in each of those cases, we offer a different set of services to augment what our clients currently have in place. So you're not only working um, with the suppliers themselves, uh, it sounds like there's some people on your team with some expertise on on suppliers working with them too, but then you're also interfacing with your clients. Um, so you've probably interfaced with many different companies in the different ways that they do supply chain management. Is that correct? Yes. So the I've been working in, like I started working with a large corporation, Nortel Networks, and did telecommunication products for the 80s and the 90s. And in that, you know, the the coordinating with manufacturing was critical to any design from the start to the finish and the transfer into manufacturing. So when I started Design First in 96, that importance of having connected supply chain and working with overseas and North American manufacturers and suppliers of components was just a normal part of business. So today, more than half our clients were coordinating some form of their supply chain strategy, supply chain contract setups. And we work with our clients as a group that represents them with manufacturers and suppliers uh, so that our clients don't have to become fully knowledgeable in all the contractual elements as we get product design together for them. But it's really a mating of two people, a partner manufacturer with a client And we're the glue in between. We're temporary. We coordinate things from a new design idea or a change to an existing product refresh. And we get out the minute our value is not needed. And those two parties continue on. But we engage daily with multiple, multiple suppliers, manufacturers all over the world. I see. And yes, I know from from my experience in product design that the supply chain um, can get really complicated. There was a project I had worked on. uh, It was a small spring that was gold plated, but it was critical. And we needed to work with the suppliers and try to develop a relationship with them. And it was a challenge because the product that was being designed was sort of custom, half custom and, and half off the shelf. So there wasn't a real desire of suppliers to develop a relationship. And then we find out that there were three deep suppliers of the supplier, that their processes affected the the quality of the product we were getting. So that was something that we had to manage and be really careful about. I was a quality engineer on on that project. And just uh, working with and managing those suppliers is a big job and uh, it's pretty critical. Yeah, and that you touched on a perfect example in terms of customized off-the-shelf parts being one of the critical things you want to manage as a design group, whether you're inside a company or an outside consultancy like ours, uh, is to separate the areas to focus on as you go from the concept through the detailed engineering, through the prototyping and testing, and into the transfer to manufacturing. You want to be having um, discussions with the affected parties, supply side and client side, on parts that you put on and what we do is a high risk list and those high risk lists would include a part like that spring and the conversations would continue on uh, based on a variety of factors this gets into sort of the nature of how much you can customize within the budget you have the time you have the size of the program you have and the intended market and size of the intended market leads to decisions around risk and decisions around reliability, and decisions around choices as you're making, putting a product concept together. Because if you design product concepts in a void where you're going to do the best thing you possibly can for a user, and you don't understand the key risks that you're inherently putting in by the choices you make on that small set of parts that are risky, you, you bake in failure. And many, many groups of design teams hand that problem off to the supply chain and to the operational team that takes over as product sales and returns. And it's really important to have that conversation with clients early on while we make trade-offs in the concept, because we're looking for a balanced concept of opportunity and risk. We're not looking for the best concept a user could possibly have. Yes. And you um, 
Yeah, you mentioned that these kind of design decisions get pushed into the operations to be able to manage, especially, and I think it's more common now since um, since 2020 and all the supply chain issues, that a, a product design will, will be spec'd out. Maybe there's a particular material listed on a component, but then that material, people can't get it. <laughs> Maybe the uh, company went out of business or that particular resin isn't available anymore. So you have to find substitutes. But that that leads into all sorts of like product testing problems later if your design spec is so nailed down to a particular material. So how do you help your customers navigate that kind of thing too, where they're in the front end of the design, choosing an alternate supplier? Um, or are you helping to identify alternate suppliers as something that's already specced? Um, what, what's your experience with that kind of thing? Um, we got lots of experience in that area, so I'll give a high-level example of uh, that. Let's talk about that spring, and it's part of a product that's being designed. In that design, let's say there's 100 parts in that design, and 80 of the parts are electronics, and 20 of the parts are custom or off-the-shelf mechanicals. And we'd like to bucket the parts in a bill of materials, even early stage where it's high-level, you know, major items, not all the components figured out yet. But of, of the known components or parts that are going on, how many would hit a high risk list? And it's high risk because it's not a known design. Someone has to design it. It's custom. Or it's a design that has to come from a supplier where they have to customize it. That, that would be the spring. Uh, or it's an off-the-shelf part where there's many suppliers and it's a mature part and the specs are well known. Of those 100 parts, you may be dealing with two or three let's say the spring is one of those that are typically customized off the shelf where a third party supplier has agreed to do it for you. Therefore it's sole sourced. And now you've got to make a decision as a business team through a client who's spending money in product development, whether you want to address that risk today or bring the conversation up again in detailed engineering, where maybe we can work through the details to get rid of that high risk and move, remove the part or change it or find something different. But eventually, through the prototyping and testing and transfer to manufacturing, your high risk list, the items that you know may give you trouble, you spend more time on. You spend more time talking about it. You spend more time thinking about whether you want to dual source. Do you want to invest the money? Because product development is time sensitive and money sensitive. And you want to bring those conversations up versus talk about the whole product or ignore the risk of that one component because the people that are making business decisions aren't aware of it. Now, I like that you've mentioned risk quite often. Now, I'm I'm wondering, uh, you know, some companies do their own risk management, but you're doing a, a different kind of risk. You're looking at supply chain management risk. Do a lot of your clients already have a system or a way to evaluate the risk of their suppliers, or is this something that you help them develop? Uh, this, we help people develop this. I, I find... In large mature companies, they've put enough time and effort to have departments that are risk and reliability oriented. But when you reach out to a consultant like us to do something that you maybe have not done before or you you need help with, trying to embed that um, mature process or forming process in your company into a third party is very difficult. So clients that find us are relieved that actually that's the way we think. And so we can um, quickly come up to speed if they have something oriented around reliability in their process of product development. If they don't, then we're actually a refreshing experience because we're actually creating the conversations and walking through the processes. They don't have to be laborious. They're just helping people identify where we should focus. And so because our process and our teams are mature in what we do with clients, it comes naturally and it doesn't cost any more to have these assessments and discussions. It does cost more if a client listens and says, you know what, we should test for that, or we should um, dual source that, or we then there's time spent to go and do that. Our job is to bring the options and risks up and the high risk, not every risk. There's lots of risks in product development that we mature and, and work out and they're at the at the working level, at the engineering level. But there are high risk lists that are business focused, marketing focused part failure, product function failure related, that you want to elevate the conversations, you want to make sure they get in they get the right level of attention. So if a product design engineer 
was developing, they were part of a team developing a subcomponent of a, of a product. And they wanted to consider the supplier management risk. And just by nature of them working with some of the suppliers, they can identify some of them. Who on the cross-functional team would it be good for them to talk more about it with? If, if they had the go-ahead from their project manager, yes, go ahead, do this. This sounds like a great idea. You mentioned that uh, there's a lot of different risks to take into consideration, uh, like, like marketing um, and the business risks. Um, are there particular people that you look to talk with that are part of the organization when you're developing this list of risky components? Or is it more of um, and or maybe it's just your experience uh, in helping a lot of other businesses through this? Well, there's a there's uh, I think every company is unique in their product development process. Um, I follow the traditional gate process and it's a rigorous step um, through procedure. So if I pick any company that we tend to work with, some may have no process at all and we're really uh, the influencers on how we're going to proceed. Other companies may have much more rigorous processes, but if I'm an engineer inside a company that has a rigorous process already, then you have to look and see, you know, what are they doing? How are they doing that design? Is there someone, am I talking with, uh, let's say you mentioned an engineer making a component selection or designing around a, you know, a function or a feature. Maybe they're creating a mechanism inside a product. Um, who else is on the team? Because it will be a time constrained exercise. And if they have a manager that says, go ahead, is there an industrial designer on the team that's representing the user? Are there user trials? Is there a marketing person that cares about that particular feature? Um, is there a manufacturer, maybe internal, um, someone that's on the manufacturing team that I could pass these things by? Um, or can I go and talk to other engineers that maybe have more experience to say, I'm designing this a certain way? Uh, the biggest thing to think about is, am I using custom parts? Because if you're using custom parts, immediately you've got capital tooling of some form or machining costs or whatever. So there's an ex extra cost that's over and above just picking that part. And if I'm doing a customized part where I found something I need to manufacture to modify, that's one of the most complex um, decisions you'll make in terms of its effect on the company, the business. What is the process internally to actually decide whether that's the only way around this and that we agree that we have to move forward with that level of complexity. Um, and if so, then, you know, the, you do want to talk to manufacturing, you want to talk to the business group, you want to identify cost of that particular decision, and you want to identify how many are you going to build? Because when you customize something and you're only making four of them, your odds of getting, you know, high quality are pretty low. You're making a thousand they're getting better if you're making ten thousand you know because there is a point from when you customize something to when you know enough about that product's maturity and its behavior in the environment you're going to put it where you know its chance of not failing is reasonable or matches the other things the other elements of the product so that it doesn't stand out as an early failure component relative to everything else Everything else has a five-year life or a 10-year life, and you're baking something in that's only going to last three months, you're creating a problem. Yeah. But you don't know that until you've done the design. It's been tested. It may be in the field already until you find there's an issue with, you know, the paint flaking off and you know, um, creating a, you know, a battery contact problem because that flaking paint is, you know, whatever it's going to be, you have no idea what it's going to be because you're not going to be able to test everything. So the long-winded answer, if you're in that engineering seat and you're doing something that's custom, who else is around you that you can tap into? How is your company set up for getting feedback from the market, from the user, from the supply? If you have none of those choices and you're on your own, then you're doing your best and you're guessing and maybe using the internet to look at potential failures in that area, but you're left with you know, no resource. Yeah. It's a um, very holistic decision when choosing components, <laughs> and it's a it's a big responsibility of a design engineer, not just designing whatever it is they're 
designing for their product, but also choosing the components and the suppliers to work with. And you're you're saying design engineers, but the, you know there's also the industrial designers, which are the the representatives of the users and the configure of the user experience. Um, and you're looking for an opportunity that solves the particular task that this new product's going to provide that does better than whatever other alternatives people have. So you have to take risks. You can't design out risk because you, when you do that, you design out the new opportunity typically. Mm-hmm. So you have to take the risk. And so all you're doing is a little bit of value analysis as you decide, yeah, it's a custom part. It has to happen. No choice. Now what do we do about it? Right. So the first check is, do we need it? And in many cases you do. You don't have a choice. The second check then is, are we going to watch this more closely? Are we going to do some testing or evaluation or modeling at some stage here before it hits the market? And are all the business people aware of that risk? Does your team get involved in um, evaluating those kind of things, like the, the reliability of a product, or do you work with other groups that do that? Um, both, again. Okay. So we're absolutely involved in the identification. We're absolutely involved in any um, hall test, lab test, bench test, model, anything that's quick that gives us an assessment of the risk that we see. So the FMEAs, the failure mode, you know, it's to sit down as a senior or experienced group of people in the area and say, okay, what would we test? Because we know this is a higher risk element. What can we test now? What can we test later once we have a more refined part? Because many times you have to wait until a manufacturer has made the part to do your final assessments. But you're doing those tests at the right times to qualify it and remove it or change it prior to just handing it into a system where everything else is fixed and then they find the problem. And that leads always to changes and other things and, you know, just the mess that nobody wants to get into and everyone does because they don't identify these things early enough on. When you're doing these risk assessments of of the supply components with the companies that you work with, what percentage of them uh, significantly change the plan for what they were going to do with with their components. I I guess I'm asking about the kind of effectiveness you see with using this risk approach to supplier management. Is it a big effect? Is it huge? And and what are some of the comments um, that you might get from the leadership of these companies about doing this process? I'm kind of lucky and our team's kind of lucky because we have experienced people. So we don't ever design ourselves through ignorance into an area where once we've configured things or as we're configuring things, we make a, a choice on a particular customization that um, leads to a problem in a later stage where, you know, we didn't know the process well enough. We didn't understand the supplier well enough. Uh, so, you know, early sampling of parts that will be customized or, you know, the the, the elements that, that we feel are on the risk list uh, is important. But if you happen to be in that group where, you don't have the experience in a particular area, you may not know that you have a risk is the is, is the biggest problem. And that risk will carry on until someone identifies it. And that truly is the value of cross-function is that someone is with experience, takes a look and says, oh, you know, I see a risk there. And so fundamentally, the changes that occur are based on the experience set of the people that are doing that in early assessment of the particular thing you're trying to include in the product or the function you're trying to provide for the product. If you don't identify that as risk because you don't have a good cross-functional functional experience team, uh, then you know, you're know you going to go through major change later on, like it or not. Yes, early feedback and independent reviews. And um, you know, it's been my experience. Um, other And, and, it's, mm-hmm. and how to do it without putting a major burden on the project because that's always how leadership looks at it. It's like, you know, how can we do a major review constantly? And it's, uh, you know, different things need different levels of, of review. You know, you have a, a value add conversation with a manufacturing group after you've finished an entire product concept. Um, those conversations get very tricky because the manufacturers don't have quite enough information on the parts to be able to really dig deep enough and give you good value, good information. And so that, you know, buried risk sticks around until you're finished most of the detailed engineering. And then they get, you know, true drawings and true specs and dimensions. And then 
all of a sudden it pops up or they couldn't add value at the first conversation in the concept area, but they can add a ton of value now that you've finished it all. And so uh, experienced teams actually have very specific conversations, not on the product overall, but on very specific elements of very specific parts with a potential supplier or manufacturer, several of them, to assess opportunity and risk and, and supply uh, early stage. But you need a facilitation, you need an experienced person to actually know what to talk about when. Many companies don't have that experience. That's why when companies find our team, they're, they're quite relieved especially if they've been through it before, that we help navigate that for them so that the change and change management that happens later on is far more predictable. Yeah, I can see that. The The earlier that you can intervene and, and catch that stuff, definitely the better. Yeah, and you, you talk about cross-functional teams. You know, there's, there's, the, um, there's two conversations there. One is cross-functional design team that's saying, you know, let's maximize this opportunity. Let's make the best product industrial designers, the engineers, the um, marketing people that say, give us a give us a concept, make modifications to this existing product so it does this new feature, new function, new thing better than anything on the market. And that's a cross-functional team that's focused on user value. Then there's a cross-functional conversation on business and market, the operational teams, the supply teams. And that cross-functional conversation is more risk-oriented but highly needed. Is it feasible? You know, the physics of what you're trying to do. Uh, Is it available? The manufacturing process, you know, the suppliers for the volumes you're looking for, that you've got somebody out there in the world that wants to do this and that is actually going to be able to, they're going to be able to do it with the specifications you need. Uh, The constraints, you know, is the thing you're asking for aligned with the project and the budget? If you're only making 100 of these, you can make different decisions many cases than if you're making 100,000. And the last thing is tested. Really, it's about all those high-risk things. Can they be tested in some form, low cost, early on to assess and get some learning from that particular risk? And the one thing you can avoid is new data that comes in because the clients discover something else or users or through some exploration or experimentation or early marketing uh, sales efforts, you've found a client that wants something new or different, or but those are those are um, business and marketing cross-functional decision teams, and they're typically focused. They love the opportunity, but they're focused on feasibility and doability. So feasible, available, constraints, and testing. I call it fact, but that's uh, oh, that that's your framework fact. What was it again? Yeah. Uh, feasible, the physics available. You know, the manufacturing process and suppliers is available to you, not to Apple. Apple can do things you can't do. All right. So is it available to you as a design team, as a company? Uh, constraints, you know, is it suited to the project and the budget for the numbers and the volumes and the quality you're trying to instill in this particular high risk element, which can be the spring as the example? And then um, the testing piece of it, the um, the ability to um, qualify, quantify, get samples, really debug, de-risk, and, and sort out whether it's the best you can do because you really want the opportunity, right? You know, on the other side, this is a careful balance between opportunity and your ability to actually pull it off in constrained timeframes, constrained budgets, and, you know, your, your market. I'm going to give you another scenario here where the engineers are they're developing a relationship with a new kind of supplier because, as you mentioned, you know, the, the company is looking at business risks and the the sort of things that you're talking about with your fact framework. And they've decided to take take a leap and do something innovative, which means they need to develop some new relationships with new suppliers. And the, the engineers are, you know, researching, they're talking with other engineers and other supplier groups, they're developing a relationship. At what point does the engineer, is it best for the engineer to involve other groups in the other assessments of that supplier. So the supplier may be technically capable, but maybe there are other business facets of the supplier that don't really meet the standards of the company. Yeah, this is a great area for conversation. Uh, and I'll talk to the leaders first of that, the project management, the the people that are 
putting engineer in harm's way by putting in front of suppliers. And it's a, it's a dance. So it's a timed conversation. So in product development that we do, uh, and I'm sure it's the same anywhere where you're investigating particular options. So let's say that spring you were looking at, it could be a leaf spring, it could be a coil spring, it could be foam, but whatever it was, I as an engineer, a designer, either one, am looking at how I would solve that problem, you know, add that spring force and the dampening force or whatever I need. And I need to go find materials. So I'm going to go out to a spring supplier, uh, sorry, a coil spring supplier, a leaf spring supplier, a foam supplier to get their spec sheets, to look at the, you know, um, variables of what I'm trying to do and make a decision. Maybe I look at three coil suppliers and three spring suppliers. So I'm reaching out to all these suppliers. So what information am I giving them about my company? the company that I represent when I'm doing the design. Um, because if I'm not careful, I'll be going to maybe a third-party supply group, as it sounded like you did, um, which when you do that, you kick off a supply chain cost that you can't get out of once you've made that introduction mm -hmm. uh, or made that reach out and that first-party response to you. They may not be the manufacturer, even though they represent themselves as one. So now you need the leaders of the company, the managers and so on, to instruct the engineers on the approach you take and what you talk about and what you don't talk about when you're engaging suppliers or potential suppliers, knowing that you're going to reach out to 10 or 15 of them in three different types of springs, and eventually you'll get down to one. But whatever one you get to, you don't want to hamstring the supply discussion that's going to go on once your production and supply teams get involved. And as a company, you want to give your engineering groups and your design groups some guidance, but not shackles, but some guidance as to how you approach the types of information you share and make sure that they have someone in that supply group should they need them to help coordinate a discussion, sign an NDA, uh, work through any details of the high probability suppliers once they've done their first round. Yeah, so those are, those are good examples of things that uh, if the company is not setting that up. That's definitely something that the engineers should be asking about and looking for. Is that correct? Well, yeah, it's not really their responsibility, but ultimately a good, if you want to be a good product developer and a good product designer, then supply is an essential element of making good decisions. And you're making design decisions and function and specification decisions. One of those other decisions is where in the world is this going to come from? And does it match the supply chain strategy for the overall product? Now, with um, I meant I think I mentioned earlier the the twenty twenty when we saw the the first hint of a lot of the supply chain management issues that everybody's been dealing with, and I I think they're still dealing with it. Is there any um lingering issue that is still elevated um, from twenty twenty and on with with companies and their supply chain? Is there an elevated issue that you're seeing that just keeps coming up or just is not going going away? Uh, Dana, yeah, I, I'm going to go back and it's to make one more statement, if I could, on the last thing, and then we can talk about that next. Um, yes. One of the things in, in, uh, in doing this for the 40 years, uh, there's, there's two types of product development. There's the product development where designers make decisions on components and they pick anywhere they can find any suppliers they can find just to demonstrate a design. And that design is then handed over to either engineering or manufacturing. And then they start to figure out supply and where that spring part is really going to come from. And then you have the iteration of can they find one that meets the specs of the original design team that got sample components from someone, you know, in their neighborhood or in their region or in their country, uh, whatever it is, but they made a choice and it's available there. So they used it. And our objective and our recommendation and the way we work with our clients is you are picking the final supply components from day one in the concept stage. You don't always, you may have three or four you can get from it. And all the off the shelf, they, excuse me, all the off the shelf parts and components that are coming and you have multiple sources, you don't have to worry about that. The customized off the shelf and the custom, fully custom parts are the areas where you want to really think more carefully about it. And so if your organization is a handoff organization where you can get a component from anywhere, 
you embed cost in your product development. You embed you embed change in your bit. You embed reliability and risk in your organization. And so I've always opposed that, and I've always um, guided or recommended to clients that they don't they impose a little longer time, but a little more effort by the design engineering teams to force them to do the supply strategy as well, the best they can, because many times you don't know where the final manufacturer is. You might know a region, you might know uh, an area uh, that is the target, or maybe there's two, but you actually impose that in the design process up front, and you'll find you do a lot fewer change management um, issues and extended budgets and things as you get to the later stages in the transfer of manufacturing and getting ready for production. I think that's good advice. And it's challenging for the engineers, but... Um... And it's not their responsibility. It's not their responsibility. Leadership has to impose that and give the right amount of support to that reach out for the engineers so they can do that. But it's definitely not the engineer's responsibility. That's why it doesn't get done until leadership actually imposes it. That's good advice to organizations and product development leaders. The more you can um, solidify some of those design decisions earlier, um, the better it is for the whole design and, and project. If you can't, and that's what I'm yeah, hearing and you if say. You can't, right? Build your high risk list, leave those components on it, bring them up, have the conversation as you step through your gates and as you solidify your design. Just make sure the business teams and everyone understands those particular components are risky for these reasons. You haven't got a final supplier. Here, and it's a custom part, or it's a you know it's got a particular thing that's risky. Sole source. There's a variety of different things that might come out, or the material may not be available in the areas where you may plan to build the product, or it requires a redesign. But even if it does, as long as the business teams understand, there's no surprises as they budget their product development stages. And that's also good advice. Just being able to communicate that, because I've seen instances where. Um... The people making decisions about the design and the components that are that are picked, uh, they know an awful lot about that kind of thing, about the the different risks, or you know they've thought through uh, potential failures or reliability concerns. But oftentimes it may not get carried through. So um, having the risk level of the components and communicating that that would be really good information to pass along from the design engineer even if it's open and in questions like you mentioned. Yeah, exactly that. In my world, the house of quality, the quality of function deployment, I'm not sure if you've used that tool that's been around since the 80s, um, which is a technique for risk and requirements. It's heavy, it's laborious, you know, large companies use it. Uh, but uh, this is a, you know, a, a lean version of that similar tool. Okay, yes, I am familiar with that. And um, sometimes FMEAs are also helpful, but I can see having a separate, um, even if it comes out of the FMEA, having a separate communication that ties back to that risk um, is an important thing to communicate. Yeah, it also justifies the FMEA. Mm -hmm. You're doing FMEA on the things you feel are risky. You can't do them on everything. Right. Right. That's just one of the steps in the assessment. You know, if you can't evaluate it, you can't get samples and test it, at least you can do an FMEA with knowledgeable people to say, here's where the risks might lie. So you can track that. Okay. Well, I think those are good actions, uh, good solutions to some of the challenges with supply chain management and engineering. And the question, I'll just answer the quick one. Where's supply chain going now? Things are stabilizing. Um, availability is much better. Uh, we only find a couple of components, um, micros, certain micros and still that are that are still long lead times, 20, 30, 40, 50 week plus. Uh, but many other things are readily available electronics wise and um, and uh, general materials wise. So things are starting to stabilize and we're not seeing all that volatility in the supply chain as much anymore. Uh, that's correct. Well, that's good news for everybody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, mm -hmm. may I ask you, um, I guess, two last questions. If a product designer was listening to this episode and they wanted to improve their supply chain management skills or ideas, do you have any recommendations for where they can learn more or have one step that they can do today to improve their situation? The answer is uh, there's different. It really probably depends a little bit on on your experience at where you're at and your organization that you're in. And um, to date, 
how you do product development. You know, and I like to um, I like to talk about when you're doing a new product design. You know, we we all have a picture in our head of what that means. And if I'm uh, um, sitting in an automotive plant and I'm um, on the engine team, then product design for me is maybe making variations on some of the um, uh, airflow channels or um, you know, some of the castings or maybe some of the materials we're using and some of the moving parts. If I'm a product designer that's in a um, consumer goods group, then my you know my world is different. I'm you know I'm, I've got a much more user centric and and I've got a lot more marketing data coming at me and um, I need to make decisions there. So a mental picture of what new product design is about. Um, has a couple of facets, which is um, how how big is this project? You know, there are companies that do very big projects, and and you've got the budgets to have reliability teams and um, facilitators, and and there's a you're you're in a very mature environment of product development, and other companies, smaller companies, typically are maybe mature, but their processes are quite a bit leaner. Um, it's shoot from the hip in many cases. It's taking existing experience with products that are in the field and problems with those products in the field, and you're doing design changes. So how big the project is, is is it incremental design, where you're making modifications to something existing and, and fairly mature, or are you doing fundamental groundbreaking, something new? You know, Dyson, when he first started the vacuum cleaners, you know, he went at vacuum cleaners, a very mature market, and he went after it in a different way. And there was lots of reasons he did, and functionality wasn't good to start, but visuals were fantastic, and he built functionality over time. And now, uh, now he's building airplane jets, right? Yeah, but it's all based on that fluid <laughs> right. flow experience that they've had over time in developing it. So if you're a product engineer, product designer, um, and you're in an organization, where are you and what kind of products do you do, incremental or fundamental? And there's a complexity spectrum on top of that. If I'm doing incremental or fundamental on a skateboard, I got 50 components. If I'm doing incremental or fundamental design on a car, I've got 70,000 components. And what role do I play in that? You know, how, what's my ability to influence the process, which we've been talking about today? And then how I fit into that process and who's around me to support me? How cross-functional is the place where I'm working in terms of when I want information, where do I get it from? Do I have to dream it up? Do I have to guess? Or can I pull on people around me? I may ultimately still have to make a decision that's risky and unique, but how much support do I have? Um, and then how big is the project from a volume point of view? If it's small, you take on a different tactic than if it's big. You're not always designing the perfect product for the perfect user. and Losing that ego and getting focused on the business at hand, which is something appropriate for the situation. And it has to include not only the user, but the business and the supply. So training, learning, um, reading up on tools, like some of the ones we discussed, and I've looked at your website, you've got some other tools as well that are great, but just to get a framework for the balance between reliability, which is risk, in terms of risk assessment, risk qualification, risk identification, um, and risk management, and opportunity, which is get the best product you can that meets and differentiates yourself over other choices users have out there in the market so that you have a better shot at selling, supporting, and you know maintaining or growing the company that you're working for, working with. Well, that's great advice, Kevin. Weighing risk and opportunity and just understanding the kind of organization that you are working in. Sometimes we get so detailed in the daily minutia <laughs> that we need a reminder to just look up and look around and and understand um, how our situation might be a little bit different than others. Yeah, and reach out. That information is out there in the world. And the use of AI, for example, writing product requirements documents, learning about the user personas, you can do that on your own. You don't need to wait for a marketing team to come in. There's things you can do to get more information in front of you to make timely decisions now. And AI has been a great tool for for that that we're starting to use more and more, not as a solution, but as an input to the conversation. Yes, I've, I've been playing it around for my own purposes too. Um, it is good as something to uh, get ideas, but then you 
you have to follow through on your own. But that might be another conversation for another interview, maybe, Kevin. Is your experience yes, using <laughs> Yeah, your experience using AI in the in the engineering field. That sounds very interesting. And supply field and marketing field and yeah, uh, design strategy field and like each of those elements, the use of it as a research tool, some of the embedded AI that's going into chipsets now that make products more functional using less battery power to do more processing at the edge in the device itself versus reliance on the cloud as the device helps a person using it to perform a task and do it more effectively, more efficiently, quicker, whatever it's going to be that are but the, the the choices now in the embedded um, learning engines that are now available to product development groups uh, are out there. Customers and, and companies that don't understand that need to reach out to companies like ours to help them embed it into what they're doing, where we become a part of their team for a short period of time. Or companies that have new ideas that don't do hardware product development, um, reach out to companies like ours that actually can help configure new value to help you embed those new features because your other competitors are going to be doing it. Well, speaking of how, how can people find out more about you and your company? Uh, super simple designfirst.com, design1st.com. Um, you'll see if we're well documented on the web, it's easy to get hold of us and have a conversation. Conversations are free. If we can help each other and we're a good fit for what you're trying to do, then we'd love to help. And how to integrate AI into your product design sounds like one of the areas you could help with. Yeah, and we're actually going to do a little um, um, pop-up. Uh, we're just finishing some work there to help people start to um, take some of the hype out of AI and how does it work with product development. We're doing a little special on our website where we'll be talking about that over the next couple of weeks. Uh, it won't be available for a couple of weeks, but it's a topical area and we'll keep revising and updating and showing people some of the tools and some of the ways and techniques that AI can influence what you're doing in product development. Now, would people subscribe to get those updates or will they be posted on your website? They're posted on the website. I mean, my uh, marketing team may request an email from you, but they're there um, so that we can share uh, the information. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Kevin, for coming on the show today and talking with us about suppliers and engineers and product development. It's very interesting. Thank you. And Diana, I... Never met a design engineer that wants to talk about reliability and quality while they're creating new concepts. And I thank you for for bringing up the conversation because it's just a balanced conversation as we all strive to do cool new things. It's also a responsibility as engineers and as designers in the process of making sure the thing that we design actually reaches a market and serves a purpose. Well, thank you for that. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Kevin. If you'd like to learn more about Kevin and his company, visit qualityduringdesign.com. This episode is summarized under the podcast blog, and there are several links to Kevin's company, and there are also links to our other interview episodes. This podcast is a production of Dini Enterprises. Thanks for listening.